Thank you. And just before we move on, um, you've spoken a little bit about phase one. Can you remind us all of um, what phase one um, is and where we are in the construction of phase one? Sure. So phase one is defined in the in Proposition 1A is the uh, connection between San Francisco and Los Angeles. And that's what we're and so we're moving forward to build that. The, what we have under construction today is the spine of the system in the Central Valley. Um, we've awarded two contracts. The board has approved. We're about to execute the third, um, which will have means uh, we'll have over 100 miles of work under contract and under construction um, in the coming weeks. Um, significant work is underway there now, um, and that will serve as the spine of the system, and then we'll co connect it north up to uh, the, the Bay Area and south to Los Angeles. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Lewis Thompson, who is the chair of California High Speed Rail Peer Review Group. And I assume, uh, uh, Mr. Thompson, you'll remind uh, us all of the um, function of the peer review group. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Remarks. My name is Lewis S. Lou Thompson. I am the chairman of the peer review group. As you may know, the peer review group was created by Proposition 1A. Uh, and our job basically is to review plans and reports and funding plans of the authority and report to the legislature. In addition, we've made every effort to work individually with members uh, who are interested in one or the other aspects of the project, and we continue to do so whenever we can, both in terms of staff discussions and discussions with members outside of the formal meetings like this. I find that can sometimes be very productive. Uh, we uh, have reviewed and issued letters to the legislature, approximately 13 letters so far on a number of subjects, including business plans. Uh, and our most recent letter was uh, January the 14th. And that letter, I, I, some aspects of that letter are relevant to this hearing. Uh, Probably the first aspect is the extreme importance of the 2016 business plan. As you may know, the project, the first business plan for this project was in 2000. Then there was a 2008, a 2009, a 2012, a 2014, and now there will be a 2016 business plan. And the project, both its costs, its demand forecasts, and its scope have morphed considerably over that period of time. Uh, and I think that's an interesting piece of perspective to keep in mind when looking at what do we really know now and where will we go from here? The answer is we're still learning. We're still working at it. Uh, we have said in our review of the uh, cost forecasting and the revenue forecasting that the authority has done, we have said that the techniques they are using are state of the art, which they are. But one of the things that those techniques reveal is the range of variation that's still there in terms of how the costs can turn out and how the revenues can turn out. So only time and only experience and good people will determine how that one is going to turn out. I can't comment, and no one should tell you now that the number is going to be 67 or 43 or any, anything like that. Nobody knows there is a range of variation, and we have to understand that that's what we're working with. Uh, a second aspect that in our most recent letter is funding. That's not a direct subject of this discussion, I assume, so I won't, I won't touch on that. But the one point that we specifically make is that oversight on this project is going to be critical. It is the largest project, as, as uh, Mr. Richard said, certainly the largest California has ever undertaken and is one of the largest ever un single project ever undertaken in the United States. It is big. And the issues, the difficulty, the technical questions, the timing, the schedule, the budget, all of those things are so important that we argue that it justifies a very detailed, specific oversight function available at the legislature. Not if you if you can see from some of the discussions of details that we've already had, if you really want to go into this level of detail about the project, you're going to be here approximately eight hours a day, many days a week, trying to cover all of the aspects. 
you can't do that and you shouldn't try, but you certainly should have a good, strong, well-funded, continuous oversight function to assist you uh, in terms of, you know, knowing the details and knowing what the issues are. Uh, that is not the peer review group. There are four of us, uh, one of which is retired and the other three have full-time jobs. Uh, it's the only board I can think of in which the chairman is also the secretary. Uh, <laughs> So what we do is try to provide senior level experienced advice on major policy questions and major issues, but we are certainly not going to be an investigatory agency, nor would we want to, even if we could. Uh, one point I would mention is that we have been working with the authority to put together what is called a dashboard indicator. They have them themselves on their finance committee but their finance committee uh, reports themselves are 50 or 60 pages and they're filled with numbers, no, none of which can non-experts really absorb. So what we have asked them to do is prepare a set of very senior level dashboards for the legislature to look at and those dashboards hopefully will say either this area you don't need to worry about right now, this area you should start worrying about, but beyond that then of course much more detailed investigation will be necessary. Uh, beyond that, I'm here to answer questions if I can, so thank you. Thank you. Well, let me open it up to uh, my colleague for questions. The uh, only thing I would say is we, uh, it, it looks like we have a number of people here I would expect who want to give public comment and we want to make sure we reserve some time at the end of the meeting for public comment. So we have uh, questions. Mr. Obernolte, to open it up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had a question for Mr. Morales. Um, so I understand that the, the draft PowerPoint that was referenced in that Los Angeles Times article, um, I understand the, the contention that we're talking about different initial operating segments and that the PowerPoint included the segment from Silmar to Burbank, which is an extra 16 miles. And you've said today that that's ad that adds $4 billion to the cost and that explains $4 billion of the $9 billion in difference between the report that was submitted to the legislature and what was published in the LA Times. Um, one thing that I'm struggling with though is if you look at the cost per mile of that initial operating segment, it's 300 miles roughly, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, just uh, prorating, it's about, it's a little over $100 million a mile is the construction cost and that, that that's the segment to Silmar. And that includes some, some difficult segments and some easy segments, but the difficult ones are very difficult, as you know. Sure. Uh, the extra 16 miles, if it's $4 billion, that's almost three times uh, as much per mile. And I wonder if you can talk about why that segment from Silmar to Burbank is so costly. Sure. It's, um, that's why we wanted to, to, to show it on the map. It's really because it's such an urbanized area so that uh, building through there and building as, as was assumed in the plan would require not just the construction, but significant property acquisition, relocation of utilities, relocation of roads, uh, putting in grade separations. It's building through an urbanized area is very expensive relative to building out in an open area. Um, and so that's really what, what drove that cost there. Okay. And then uh, quickly, Mr. Chair, I had a question about the Federal Stimulus Act funds, and I know we're depending on those to help us complete the uh, the project, but if my understanding is if we don't spend those funds by September 30th of 2017, right. that we will lose access to them. And as we're all aware, the language in the Bond Act for High Speed Rail Authority uh, is contingent on getting matching funds from other sources. So are we confident that we're going to be able to expend those, time, those funds on time? Yes. The... Um we have uh, we received r roughly 2.2 .2 billion dollars of of stimulus funds, um, and as you said, they're subjected to the September 30th, 2017 uh, requirement. Um, we are very focused and absolutely intent on ensuring that we get every single one of those dollars put to use by the deadline. Uh, we're working closely with the Federal Railroad Administration to ensure that we do that. Um, and we continually look at, at our expenditure rate and what we can do to make sure we meet that deadline and we are confident we will meet that deadline. Right. Yes. May I just supplement uh, very quickly uh, on both points? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, first on the second one, Mr. Obernolte, um, it is also important, uh, I know you know this, but I just, for the public to understand, it's not an on-off switch. If, um, if we don't submit 
funds uh, invoices for all the money. Um, we, what we lose would be those funds that we hadn't spent yet. They don't come back and recapture the earlier amounts. So. Um, the, the risk is that we leave some dollars on the table. The risk is not that we leave all the dollars on the table. Um, the second thing I wanted to say, <clears throat> if I can say it, um, is that one of the unfortunate things about the article was that even if you took this document at face value, what the article ignored was that this was projecting that in the northern sections we were going to be $2.5 billion under the previous cost. So. Again, taking this document fully at face value, it showed that the southern section was going up about $8 billion. The northern section was coming down by billions of dollars. The net effect was a $2.5 billion or 4.7% change in the program, at worst case, taking this at full face value. So there was no discussion of the offsetting lower costs in other sections. And, uh, and then Mr. Morales has explained why um, at least half of the increase in the southern section was attributable to simply a redefinition of the scope. And the other half was about uh, people thinking we were going to use viaducts when, in fact, we think we can use surface structures, as has been the case in the Central Valley. So um, it's really hard for me to restrain my enthusiasm for talking about how irresponsible the reportage on this report was. Well, we're certainly looking forward to seeing the revised report next month. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Williams, followed by Mr. Gordon. Well, it, it's not the only example of, of uh, um, overworked and under-resourced reporters in this day and age not doing adequate fact-checking, um, uh, but maybe it's just a little bit bigger because the project is bigger and more shocking of a difference because the, 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 the bigger project um, it does bring up, though, what kind of recourses and what kind of protections do you and uh, acting on behalf of the taxpayers of the state have <coughs> when a contractor might bring in cost overruns? I'm not very familiar with dealing with that with mass transit projects, but I am with uh, you know, civically uh, funded building projects or civically funded um, uh, smaller mass transit projects. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, so when the cost of gas is going down and uh, a contractor says they want more uh, you, you, for a bus project, you go, well, I don't think, that, I don't think so, right? right? Um, but uh, in a building project, if they come in and the price of steel is skyrocketing, then you calculate whether that's a fair cost overrun. What protections do we have when a contractor comes in for a, a cost overrun? Well, let me take a shot at that. Mr. Morales will. <clears throat> um, and, you know, I have some direct experience in this. I spent 12 years as a member of the BART board, and we built $4 billion of extensions, including the San Francisco airport and so forth. Um, we worked with a lot of contractors, and including one of the big contractors on our project, who, quite frankly, has been involved in, in uh, situations in the past where there have been a lot of change orders. And, you know, Mr. Morales said that the three contracts that we've got so far have come in under our engineer's estimate. That's a good thing. However, it also puts us on high alert because those contractors know that they're below our engineer's estimate and they may be looking for ways to recapture things. So what happens, Assembly Member, is that there's a process for change orders, if we decide halfway through something that we think something needs to move here or there and we issue a change order, the contractor has a legitimate reason to reprice on that. There also could be reasons for change orders where we stumble. If we tell the contractor, okay, we understand you're going to start building this bridge on this date, we're going to deliver the parcels to you and we don't get the right-of-way acquisition done, and the contractor has gone out and he has rented equipment and put people on notice, he has a legitimate claim for those costs against the state. So we look at all those things. Um, there are going to be change orders. There are going to be change orders. There are going to be claims. And there are going to be contractor claims that, by the way, we will look at and say, we're sorry, we disagree with this. And we have contractual provisions that handle 
how that works. And so every single contractor claim. So don't be misled if you see a story saying that the contractor is coming in with these claims because that's just the start of the process. We get to say, well, wait a minute. Actually, we think you did some things that screwed things up and we got a counterclaim against you. This is what happens in large construction projects. And in my experience, the way to deal with the contractors is to be fair and say, you know what, if it's our fault, we're not going to screw around with you. We'll take care of it right now. If it's a dispute, you're not going to screw around with us, and we'll deal with it in a dispute resolution process. But the contracts themselves have provisions for how to deal with these things. And this is also the reason why we're constantly looking at our contingency. Okay, what changes might be coming that would be eating into that contingency? That's how we manage the program, by measuring that and measuring the risks to that so that then we can stay on top of it. But you have a right to look at us and say, what claims were paid? Why were they paid? Did you adequately defend against those? Uh, or was it a fair cost that just became part of the cost of the project? Yeah, let me, I'll, I'll just amplify a little bit. A few, <coughs> few specific things that we do to first try to get the best value we can at the front end and then to maintain it. And um, some of that comes from the uh, the bidding environment. We've worked very hard to create as competitive a bidding environment as possible. Um, and we've been very fortunate and successful in that to date. Uh, we've had world-class teams, um, four and five of them bidding on each of our contracts to date. That competition plays an important part in driving down costs, obviously, the more competition we have. Um, secondly, using the design build process for us um, uh, has, has real advantages. And, and under the design build process, we take the design and put it out to bid at a, roughly a 15% completion, uh, which really then d gives the basic characteristics of what the system looks like, sets the standards. But then the bidders have the opportunity to come in and finish the design, propose innovative ways to complete that design, and then move it into construction and find more efficient ways, uh, hopefully, than, than we would have found. And that's what we've seen happen in this process. Um, the, as Mr. Richard said, in any big project, there will be change orders. Um, in any small project, <laughs> there are going to be change orders. And, I would venture to guess that over the course of this program, the change orders will be in the hundreds, if not thousands, over the course of the project. You know, but a change order is not a four-letter word, uh, you know, if you will. It's change orders can be, they can be things that increase costs. They can be things that decrease costs. The vast majority don't have no cost impact. I mean, a change order can be the equivalent of. Uh, if you're remodeling your house and the contractor says, "Do you want the light switch here or there?" You know, that could, that's a change order in, in our sense of things. And so we will have at any given point numerous change orders out for our consideration. We have a very detailed, rigorous process to look at change orders uh, to ensure that, that they're, they're valid to and negotiate the prices. And we have dispute resolution processes built in if we ultimately can't agree with the contractor on what the price of anything is, if they're seeking an increase, as you said, and we don't think it's justified or if they're not entitled to it under the contract. Uh, we have a d dispute resolution process where we bring in independent parties to resolve that, to, to drive it down. Lastly, I would just mention the uh, an ongoing piece of that is, is our risk management process. Um, we continually look at where we are in the program, what susceptibility we may have to potential delays or cost increases, um, and whether they're due to actions on our part, and then we can take appropriate steps to mitigate those, or um, if they could be due to the contractor's part, and then we, uh, we hold them accountable for that and, and urge them to do everything they can to avoid it. Mr. Gordon, followed by Mr. Patterson. Thank you. Um, I, a few comments and, and then a question. Um, I appreciate, first of all, that uh, candidly today much of the testimony was defensive relative to uh, a newspaper article. Um, I'm uh, actually looking forward, um, and um, uh, as Mr. Thompson said, uh, I think the 2016 business plan is going to be probably one of the most critical documents that um, this legislature will need to review. Um, and I'm 
pleased that uh, our chair has uh, said that we will hold um, uh, oversight hearing uh, on that uh, document and, and have a chance to, to delve into it. Um, the, um, uh, I am hopeful that that document will um, address a few issues. Uh, one is um, uh, that the, the um, true cost and, and uh, relative to tunneling in Southern California. Uh, the, um, I, I have some experience uh, as an elected official overseeing a project relative to tunneling at uh, Devil's Slide in my <laughs> then supervisorial district and at one point in my assembly district. Um, and um, uh, there is uh, no more challenging effort than a tunneling project and the cost related to that and, and potential cost overruns. So I'm hopeful that the report will address that carefully. Um, the, um, there's also uh, uh, rumors afoot that uh, there may be some uh, proposal to change uh, timing uh, of, um, uh, of routing uh, or of, of construction from Southern California and Northern California. And I also would look forward to that being addressed in the report. Um, I, um, uh, those are the comments. That moving to the question, uh, you know, I, I know that uh, uh, Mr. Richard, you've uh, made it a point in your tenure to, to work towards a great transparency. Um, and um, um, one of the things that, uh, that I'm aware of is that in um, uh, the competitive bidding process that uh, you've talked about, Mr. Morales, that um, it, we're able to see the, um, you know, the final contract. So we know what the contractual arrangement is. But it, uh, my understanding is that uh, the bids have not been made public. Uh, and it, I'm curious, is, is that related to uh, trying to maintain this competitive process or some other reason, to, or am I mistaken? It, it, um, I would hesitate to use the word mistaken, but I would say, yeah. Uh, we, uh, okay. we, we do That's publish them. We, uh, no, we do, we do post the bids. Um, the only, uh, on, on what we do is wait until, in fact, we have completed the procurement process and executed the contract before posting them because, and so for instance, on the last contract, um, we are in the process of negotiating the contract, expect to have that completed in the next few weeks. If we do not come to successful conclusion on that negotiation, we could then turn to the next bidder. And so until we've actually inked the contract, we don't, we don't post all of the bids because we may still be in negotiation. Once we have concluded that, though, the bids are, in fact, posted. They're on our website, available, um, and they're, they're, they are publicly available. Appreciate the clarification and sure. look forward to um, our next oversight hearing. Thank you. Mr. Patterson. Thank you. Um, I don't want to uh, revisit uh, the Los Angeles Times story, uh, but I do want to suggest that it sparked some big picture concerns of mine with respect to the decisions that the authority has made to move uh, from uh, the Central Valley, then across the Tehachapis, uh, drilling uh, into the San Gabriel Mountains, and eventually to uh, the, San Bur uh, the, um, uh, the Burbank uh, station, um, which, as you look it over, and as the uh, other experts that weighed in on the, the story, it was this is going to blow up your, your time sequence, and it's going to blow up the budget. Um, so that's where I think the huge concern mm -hmm. uh, with respect to time budgeting and the decisions that, that, were, being, that were being made. Um, so now we, we understand that uh, I guess that section has been cut off of the, the proposal. But sooner or later, you're going to have to get uh, to Burbank and drill the tunnels through the mountains. Uh, so you still maintain that given that route and the complexities along that route, that it can come in on time and at $68 billion overall. Um, assembly member, first of all, <clears throat> I don't, um, I mean, I fully understand why anybody would have those questions reading the article. Um, <clears throat> what we did bring with us today, I'm not suggesting that he testify, but I just wanted to demonstrate 
Uh, we have a gentleman with us who is on our team, uh, Mr. Uh, Francisco Fernandez La Fuente, who previously headed the infrastructure arm, the investment arm of the world's largest infrastructure company, ACS, Grupo ACS out of Spain. They built the Pyrenees tunnels. Um, Mr. Fernandez is an expert in the tunneling methodology. If anything, he's telling us that they believe that with modern tunneling techniques, they think that the cost would be less than what we've estimated at this point. The Tehachapi's, Mr. Morales makes a point that I always like to share, which is that Union Pacific got over the Tehachapi's with picks and shovels in the 1800s. When Mr. Obernolte turns on the tap of water at his home, some of it is coming from Northern California through tunnels that were drilled through the Tatchby's, across the faults, and down into Los Angeles in the 1960s. Um, yes, tunneling is a challenge. I served on the BART board. There are two BART tunnels that go under the Hayward Fault. Um, in the 89 earthquake, there was no impact on tunnels. Um, these are things we know how to do. Are there going to be challenges? Yes. Sometimes there are unexpected challenges in tunneling. Um, it may turn out to be more expensive in that area. I can't tell you that it won't. But I can also tell you, by the way, contrary to what was in the article, that we did offer to provide our tunneling experts to the reporter who did not avail himself of that. Had he, he would have heard people who said that this is a technical challenge that is within the bounds of understanding and capability of the modern construction industry. The people of California have asked us to build a high-speed rail system that goes from Anaheim, Los Angeles to San Francisco. The only way to do that is to go through the mountains. When this legislature looked at it, when the public voted on it, they expected that we could do that. And I guess I would say, sir, that um, I think this is an area that is you know, quite legitimate to drill down in, make sure that we've got the numbers, that we can provide you satisfactory information on it. But on a larger scale, I would say that as hard as this project is, one of the exciting things about it is we do this as Californians. I mean, we built the world's largest hydroelectric system here. We built the world's largest geothermal system here. We brought natural gas down from Canada in one of the longest pipelines here. We used to have confidence that we could do this stuff. These days, we seem to be flagging in that. And I think one of the things we're going to show here is that that is something that Californians have always achieved, and we will. That's different than answering your questions about the cost and the time and the challenges. And sir, we're prepared to do that at any point. We have the experts on our team who have international experience. We have a high level of confidence that we're going to be able to do this. Yeah.